So uh, just as background, um, up until the middle 1400s, if you wanted to store, transmit information or ideas in text format, you would have had to write them out yourself longhand or hire a scribe. And around 1450, Gutenberg and his business partners who were like venture capitalists set up a printing press uh, in the city of Mainz, which is close to Frankfurt. And over the subsequent decades, this technology leaks out to cities across Europe. Uh, so there's a couple hundred cities with for-profit uh, printing press establishments by the early 1500s. And in 1517, a junior faculty member at a provincial German university uh, circulates a set of criticisms of church ideology, practice, and institutions. And uh, Luther's intervention precipitates uh, the Protestant Reformation. And one of the remarkable things is that you know, when uh, the organization that had a quasi-monopoly on religious uh, life in Europe pushed back, Luther and his colleagues and comrades, what they did is they, they went to the new media to disseminate their ideas. So this was the first time in which the new media was used systematically to mobilize a social movement, okay? So, um, you know, there, there's many reasons why one would be interested, but uh, over the last couple of decades, there's been this really rich literature in economics emerging about the role of uh, institutions, culture, and religion as just like fundamental and deep determinants of performance and behavior. And typically, we think about those things as you know, really sticky, persistent, quasi-fixed uh, aspects of social life. You know, here we have a situation where they're changing dramatically. And uh, you know, the whole research agenda on institutions obviously raises the question, OK, why and how do institutions change? Um, so these dynamics are really important. The Reformation uh, is one of the most important, arguably, changes in the last several hundred years of European history. Uh, and it's, among other things, a media event. So the social historians emphasize how critical print media was uh, for the diffusion of these ideas. Uh, but they're confronted by like a quasi big data problem. You know, there's thousands and thousands of pamphlets and books. Uh, many of them are effectively sort of unknown to scholars. And it's really hard to measure or document uh, the diffusion of ideas uh, in the media historically. Or, you know, it, it is for, for, for the methodology that social history is typically used. And, you know, you may also, uh, just sort of from contemporary life, you know, we're interested in new media and large scale social change today. And it's interesting to reach deep into the, to the sort of time series to think about past moments when social change has been associated with uh, new media. Um, so what do we do uh, in this research? So really, uh, this is preliminary, but three things. So the first is we construct a measure of uh, Protestant content in the media. So we put together this data set on all the known books and pamphlets produced in German-speaking Europe over a 150-year period. So on the one hand, this is incredibly impressive data, you know, all the known books. But, you know, there's something sort of very unsettling about all known, right? So questions of what survives are really live, and we can talk about that. Uh, so this is firm level data, and there's 100,000 odd uh, pamphlets produced by about 1,000 firms over this time frame. And what we'll do is, you know, we will classify hitherto unclassified content. And you know, essentially, this is going to be taking tools that people might use to think about social media today to historical uh, text data. The second step is to think about how competition uh, may have impacted diffusion. So, so the, first, um, the first sort of stylized fact is that cities where there were more firms in the local media market were more apt to start producing some Protestant content. And conditional on producing some were more apt to produce more. Uh, the second is that it seems like competition was sort of like a substitute for political freedom. So uh, the cities that we're thinking about were essentially falling into two constitutional classes. There were so-called free cities, and there were cities that were not free. And competition matters more in the cities that are not free, where jurisdictionally there's less autonomy at the municipal level. So, you know, once I sort of tell you that there's this correlation between how competitive a local media market was and the diffusion of uh, these new ideas, you know, it's, it's natural to wonder whether the features that were associated with having more firms competing, you know, underlying were, were determining your, your readiness to accept the new. And, you know, we can't solve this in any definitive way. 
uh, but we can sort of show you some evidence on shocks to firms that are associated with the timing of these manager deaths. You know, arguably the timing of a manager death is not related to the underlying propensity of a city to adopt the new. Um, and finally, and this is going to be like even more gestural, uh, we'll talk a little bit about institutional change. So the Protestant Reformation wasn't just about changing beliefs. You know, it was a set of originally like small scale municipal revolutions. And where the revolutionaries were successful, laws were changed. And these laws have a number of really remarkable features. But among other features for economists, they set up these extraordinary institutions for uh, human capital accumulation. So public schooling on a mass level across Germany. So if you want to think about like the deep origins of persistent differences in human capital accumulation, this is a super interesting uh, setting. OK, so let me just say, like, just to, to think about classifying content, you know, where we're going is like, essentially an index of content where pamphlets are more or less like unalloyed Catholic ideology or more or less like unalloyed Protestant ideology. And you know, these two panels are religious media in German or religious media in Latin produced in German-speaking Europe over this uh, time frame. So you, know, you see a different pre-trend in the German media than in the Latin media, uh, but you see these stark discontinuities right around the date that Luther circulates his theses. OK, so, so the, the, this is the average of our religion index in aggregate. The circles are scaled to the number of varieties produced in each year. So the fact that the German circles are getting bigger means not just that the content is changing its sort of you know, complexion, but there's suddenly more titles in German. OK, whereas the, the, Latin, the number of Latin publications is effect, effectively quasi-constant. OK, so th this is the big macro picture. And then what we can talk about now is uh, digging a little bit into variation at the local level uh, behind this uh, aggregate picture. OK, so what do historians say about the Reformation? So uh, among other things, they suggest that print media was indispensable. Uh, you know, the, and a simple counterfactual is to look at past heresies that failed, uh, uh, like the Hussites, uh, where you know, he was burned at the stake and they burned along with him. You know, like, couple hundred manuscripts. And it's much harder when you have a print media disseminating things, these things at extraordinarily low cost. Um, they also suggest that you know, this had an institutional impact and that the, you know, the key impact of printers and their decision making was in these pivotal years, a decade or so around uh, Luther's uh, intervention. OK, so let me walk through a few facts that I think are useful because uh, I am probably the only economic historian. Uh, so uh, the first is that prices were quite low. So a typical laborer could, with a couple hours worth of work, afford to buy uh, a pamphlet. Uh, literacy uh, is really hard to pin down, but was exceedingly low. So it's not the case that all city dwellers were reading. Uh, really, the story is one in which uh, these pamphlets and books are circulating. People who can read are influenced by them and then in sermons or by reading aloud or by talking in taverns and in church naves, they start to share these ideas with a much broader public, okay? Um, and I, I mean, arguably this would be the case for the way uh, influence works today. It's like I, I listen to AM talk radio or whatever cable news, but then I talk with my uh, fellows on my lunch break. It's not just like somehow the, the media signal by itself ha has its impact. So uh, diffusion happens first at the city level. Uh, it takes a decade plus before the rulers of the various principalities of the political entity that we're looking at start becoming actively involved in the Reformation. So these uh, various uh, objects are the principalities of the Holy Roman Empire which was the polity in Central uh, Europe in this time frame. So you should sort of have in mind when you see a regression with a fixed effect or clustering at the principality level, you know, this is a story about comparisons amongst cities within one such principality. Um, so the Reformation also is notable as uh, a movement that is not a movement from above. So it's a popular movement, 
Uh, even in Wittenberg, which is where our, you know, our junior faculty insurgent was based, uh, what he did and his fellows did went far beyond what the, uh, the authorities at the city or at the state level wished for. Okay? And that is sort of generically the case. Uh, so there's many examples, like in, in Zurich, uh, the Reformation starts when uh, a group of pr a printer and his workers uh, commit an act of civil disobedience and they eat sausages in their like, place of production on a fasting day and they're arrested. And then a pamphlet is printed like, in support of them. And then there's like, a debate and there are marches, there's street theater and so on. And you know, these sorts of from the ground up movements eventually win the day in the cities that they win the day. Um, okay, so I don't know what your priors are about uh, the regulation of economic activity in early modern Europe, but printing effectively does like a Schumpeterian end run around otherwise quite prohibitive regulations on entry. Uh, so, you know, it is sufficiently new and uh, sort of unanticipated that the existing set of regulations do not constrain their ability to open shops. Now, it's, it's a high fixed cost business, so, so that's, that's a really important feature of uh, this, this industry, but it's not initially, prior to the Reformation, being restricted by, uh, by regulation. Okay, so the data here, so we have this data from the Universal Short Title Catalog, which is giving us 100,000 odd publications. And um, the data doesn't have direct uh, information uh, on which firms are printing which things. It classifies 37 uh, types of subject matter, you know, from agriculture, cookbooks, witchcraft, uh, science and mathematics, accounting textbooks, and religion. And so what we're essentially gonna do here is think about in effect, breaking the religion category between Protestants and Catholics. Um, so what we'll do is identify authors who wrote about half of the religious book. So there's 455 superstars, including Luther. And we're also gonna code up the firm that produces each individual book, okay? So that we will have panel data on all the firms. Uh, and our unit of analysis is gonna be uh, a variety, okay? So Sadly, we do not know, except for a small subset of the data, exactly how many copies of a given pamphlet were produced. We just know that this idea was circulating in a location at a time. Okay, so let me first tell you how we uh, code the firms, because that matters for how you know, we get some sort of rough evidence on competition. So we look at these inscriptions on the front pages of the books, and the printers, names come in various different forms, sometimes like a German form, sometimes a Latin form, sometimes with other forms of text. And we basically, it's just like a cleaning it up process. Um, some of these guys, I don't know if this is a light, like this Anna, she's the first printer, first woman printer in Europe. And this I-N suffix is an indicator, it's a you know, feminine indicator in German, so we have to go and find who she matches to, and she matches, she's the widow of this Thomas, okay? So one thing we do is we match everyone by cleaning the names. The second is if, if you see Thomas in 1502, 1503, 1504, and then Anna in 1505, we infer from that the date of his death, okay? So that's gonna give us some evidence on shocks to the local IO in these firms. Uh, the second thing that's notable is that these, these people uh, sometimes work in joint ventures, right? So I'll show you a little evidence on inter-firm networks and links, uh, which, you know, a, a firm with more links, uh, a, death with a death in a firm with more links means something different than a death in a firm with fewer links. Okay, so this is a microcosm of what we do for the, the, uh, the complete data. Um, so this is a, a quick summary of the landscape of firms in Central Europe. Uh, you know, we move from a world where there are very few firms, very few cities, very few books, to one in which, uh, you know, dozens of cities have printing presses, large numbers of firms are, are producing. Okay, so uh, what is the, the, the data that we use to try to assess the religious or ideological 
uh, position of, of these uh, uh, authors. We're going to use um, the, the, the titles, the historic titles of these books. And uh, you know, essentially, we're going to use, as you'll see, this model from Matt Taddy. Uh, you know, Taddy has a nice paper on uh, 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 analyzing Twitter tweets in recent US elections. You know, a Twitter tweet is capped at 140 characters. Uh, the median title in our database has more than 140 characters, OK? And I think the hope is that you see these two, which are two of about 150, 160 in English printed in Germany. And you can see that these convey a large amount of information about the, the sort of political position of the thing that you're about to read. I mean, they're quasi-glosses. They're a little bit like abstracts. Um, so 96% of the books in our database are in Latin or in German. And there's just like a handful of these English language books. And you know, in an Anglophone setting, it's, it's, it's easier to show you uh, these English things than historic German. Uh, so you, OK, if you want to think about I don't know whether you guys are excited about this, but like, there's all sorts of interesting questions about how do you stem? Do you stem? Orthography is non-standardized, right? Uh, you know, there are interesting features of historic text, arguably similar issues in Twitter tweets. You know, spelling conventions are decaying. Um, OK, so our model is uh, there are two types uh, of uh, you know, actors. They're Protestants and Catholics. So this does some violence to, to the, the nuances uh, of the, you know, the, the religious debates. But it's, we think, of like a, a nice and parsimonious starting point. Um, and uh, we use the publications by these authors whose religion we know to basically uh, this is, I think, fam very familiar to some people. To some people, it may be novel. But uh, you know, we identify the phrases that are uh, most indicative of uh, you know, a particular religious perspective. And then we're going to project out and uh, you know, uh, you know, infer the, the uh, unobserved religion for the, the people we don't know uh, a priori. Um, so we're going to get these weights that are going to relate phrases to religion. The way we do this is by first identifying a vocabulary of religious phrases. Our vocabulary, it's, you know, it's a multinomial distribution with 5,000 phrases. But if you had a baby example, it, it might be something like this. Like there would be a Lutheran text and a Catholic text. And the Lutherans like to, to always uh, emphasize the academic credentials of their speakers. You know, Luther is always you know, uh, described as having this doctorate. Uh, the Catholics, of course, don't accord uh, uh, the Lutherans uh, that respect. So just to have a little bit of a sense of what's under the hood, you know, there are phrases that are uh, used more or less frequently. So this is the frequency of word use in our data. Uh, and then this is the, the log odds ratio of these phrases. So these phrases at the bottom are the, the highly Catholic phrases based on just the odds of use. The ones up top are the, the Protestant ones. And, and what we'll do is we'll run these. These, these are the support for the estimation routine. Uh, we're going to pick the ones that are you know, crossing these two thresholds that we've uh, colored blue. So this is, this is just the data, and these are the log odds ratios of these words. That, and we use this to just identify our vocabulary. So you guys use the chi-squared measure. We just use a different measure in our context. It's, they're, they're very similar in results, but there's slightly less uh, like sort of type one and type two error with with this being the grounds on which we define the vocabulary. Um, okay, so we estimate, th this is sort of a, a little bit repetitive in the sense it's this is like we're just crawling inside an estimation shell that uh, Matt Taddy has laid out for us. But, you know, we estimate a scalar summary that, you know, preserves uh, information on, uh, uh, on the religion of authors. Um, then we look at the relationship between actual religion and this summary statistic and obtain effectively an alpha and a beta. And we can use these things to project out over the people who are unknown. So there are many ways to, to assess it. So uh, the paper now has like a 20 or 30 page appendix about uh, various ways to kick the data. But like a simple thing is, OK, take repeated samples and hold out 20% of the people you know, estimate over the other ones, and then see how well you predict. Um, and that provides some interesting corroborating evidence. So we do relatively well. We've purposely, just for illustration in this one iteration, held out Lutheran Eck 
who are you know, the canonical figures in this debate, um, you know, something that you might be interested in is there, there is this longer tale of Catholics who we are uh, sort of essentially saying, you're using Protestant-like language and we, we make mistakes on them. Um, we pick up a few more of them when we include um, some fixed effects for region and time. So another concern could be like, you guys are using a huge time window to estimate, isn't language relatively plastic and dynamic? Um, so we can do a little bit uh, better on a couple of these guys uh, with these fixed effects, but uh, it, it doesn't seem, it seems like they actually are speaking like Protestants on some fundamental level. Okay, so um, that estimation routine buys us uh, this big picture story and we wanna dig uh, into it uh, a little bit further. So what are the determinants of diffusion? Um, so historians have emphasized uh, this sort of constitutional, institutional difference among cities. That there are free cities, which were uh, places where the Reformation was adopted quickly, and then there were cities that were not free where it was less so. Uh, they also, uh, in some, I guess, by our lights, looser sense, talk about the development of the, the media industry. Um, there's this question about whether or not different lords had different preferences, but fundamentally, uh, censorship was uh, pretty weak, uh, and you know, the, the social historians don't uh, typically suggest or find that it was a, a key constraint. So what we'll talk about is competition at the local level, uh, to begin, uh, where we're gonna think about the number of firms that are competing within a city, and the reason why the city is really the unit of analysis is because it was exceedingly costly to trade between cities, okay? So this is a world, it's like a multinational that can you know, produce in one location and sell overseas, or it can locate production at, in, the, in the overseas market. And typically what was done is like a, a book would be taken to a new place and printed there. You know, it's like a blueprint for, for, a, for a, a publication, and you can print it in this new place. Um, and we'll look at these institutions, we'll look at territory level institutions and also some within territory variation. So, but, but I think objectively, these things are really uh, costly to transport and they're actually relatively, the iceberg costs are quite high because if the pages get damp in transit, <laughs> we're dealing with like an era where it's like, you know, nice sealed containerized shipping is not actually on offer, right? Uh, it's like on the back of a mule in the rain in like Bavaria. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's, it, a lot of books can get ruined. Okay, so, so intellectual property protection is virtually uh, off, the, off the table. So there's some license within a city, but typically the jurisdiction of that quasi copyright does not extend to other cities. So piracy is just like a central feature of author's correspondences. It's like someone down the road got my book and is reprinting it. Um, okay, so uh, this is a, a, a graph of city populations as against the number of firms that are active for the cities that I have city population. So there's a subset that we don't know uh, their, their uh, population in 1500. Um, so this is already speaking somewhat to this idea. You know, there are, there are cities with similar populations, or similar titles per, per firm that uh, have different numbers of firms. In terms of institutions, uh, you, you saw the, the map with these different principalities. You can think of them as like states in the United States, but within them, there are cities that are subject to lords and there are cities that are so-called free cities. The free cities are, are not free in the sense that you and I would uh, uh, use that word, but the, the, the Lord does not have direct jurisdiction over them and does not control the city walls, among other things. So these are cities that you could not just come and go from. You know, they, there were walls. You had to sort of say who you were in a quasi-passport setting. Um, okay, so we're going to think about, just to start, uh, uh, looking at, exposure to Protestant media as a sort of two-part process. Um, you know, there's, does a city produce any? Are people exposed? And then conditional on getting exposed, uh, how much or how intensely are they exposed to this media? Uh, you know, this is a this setting where there's a lot of cities where there are essentially no, no Protestant uh, books get printed. Um, so there's a lot of zeros and, uh, you know, there, there would be problems with treating this as like a Poisson distribution. So that's 
that's why we go down this particular uh, uh, path. Um, then we'll talk a little bit about variation due to these manager deaths. Then uh, the fact that our measure of competition matters for Protestant books, but not for Catholic books. Um, and then how this relationship between competition and media evolves over time. The Germans have this tradition in history, this sort of uh, early scientific history, Ronkian history, where they just like compile facts. And a scholar can make his whole life compiling facts. And there are these books that are like essentially biographical dictionaries of all these printers. And so what we've done is like read through them all. And that's where we get like, among other things, their deaths, and did they run into trouble. And it's the guys in Cologne, I mean, they definitely got crushed if they tried to go Protestant in Cologne, but elsewhere, not so much. Um, okay, so, uh, you know, th th these are a bunch of uh, uh, logistic regressions where we basically say, okay, does a city uh, produce any Protestant media? Conditional, and we're thinking about the relationship between that and the number of firms in the pre-period and we're controlling for how far you are from Luther's base and some measures of uh, Latin and vernacular media in the pre-period, whether or not this city is part of a specific trading network, and in some of these specifications, you know, which principalities. So you know, these uh, principality fixed effects are, are keeping our, our comparison between like Leipzig and Dresden. They're very close. They're in the same principality. One has more, more firms than the other. Uh, what's the, uh, you know, the likelihood that you're going to print any Protestant material. Um, this interaction between the number of firms and, and whether or not you're a city with a uh, lord is, you know, it's not uh, a, uh, entirely uh, uh, sealed evidence, but it's suggestive of the fact that, you know, it's cities that were subject to lords that have some sort of differential slope on competition. Okay, so this is a potentially competition as a substitute for uh, political freedom. I mean, I don't know. Authoritarian regimes everywhere on some level are, are thinking that uh, in, most, in most instances. Um, OK. So that when we turn to the counts, this is you know, essentially how many Protestant books or, or varieties are produced. Uh, you know, we again see uh, you know, having more firms is associated with 5% you know, uh, more Protestant uh, material subsequently, one extra firm. So I guess the thought experiment is going from four to five firms, five to six firms. Um, you see something sort of much weaker in terms of this interaction effect for uh, cities that are subject to Lord. So it seems like the effect, for s the, the effect on this, uh, on the, on the Lord uh, firm interaction is much more do you, do you print any of the new stuff, not how much do you print. Um, okay, so uh, it's natural to wonder what is uh, behind the variation in the number of firms in a media market, right? Uh, th this may be given to us by many things that are very hard for us to uh, observe directly. So what we'll think about is variation um, that's induced by the timing of the deaths of these printers. Um, so you know, this is sort of like another way, it's like the history literature like this this literature on the death of managers in contemporary settings. So these printers are, are like printer publishers. Um, they uh, are not just like technicians producing, uh, uh, you know, an object. Um, so they, they are highly skilled. They, they typically know several languages. Um, they are also prone to collusion. Um, so I cut out that Adam Smith quote where, you know, like, People of the same trade rarely meet except to conspire against the public. Um, these guys were in social networks, were conspiring against the public. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a lovely quote. Uh, so so the, the, these, uh, these uh, printers were typically uh, in the same social circles, and we, we know about their collusive practices, sometimes because they actually wrote down contracts. There was no antitrust authority preventing them. And so some of these contracts survive. Uh, but some of it is sort of inferred from more circumstantial evidence. Um, so uh, the deaths matter uh, for within city competition, again, because of these transport costs. So social historians suggest that these deaths are really important. Um, you know, one of the, the things that social historians have been interested in in thinking about these deaths is uh, like a transition to a woman actually running a business. So that was one way that women would run businesses historically as if their husbands died. Um, I'll also show some evidence on uh, deaths essentially weighted by something else. 
So it's not the case that bigger firms matter more when there's a death, but it is true that when a firm with more network links uh, uh, has a bigger effect when, when the proprietor dies. Okay, so uh, when we go uh, to the data and code up the deaths, there's essentially two types of deaths. There's the death of active printers, which is gonna be our treatment. I'm not gonna show you, but there's a sort of in the background a placebo, which is the deaths of retirees or the deaths of no longer active printers. So people who die after they've stopped printing, when they die, nothing happens in the local IO. It's not like new entrants show up, but someone who is still working and they die, that's where the action is. So th this, this is gonna be our treatment. And you know, there's a reasonable mass of people who are dying relatively young. Okay, so in the annual data, I think probably unsurprisingly, uh, in the years in which a manager dies, we see uh, increase in entrance. Uh, and you know, this is even true within like, uh, you know, a window in a given city. So the idea here is, you know, in a 10-year period in Chicago, it's the specific year in which the manager dies that we see the entrance response. Uh, it's also true that we see that the number of firms increase in the year when a manager dies. So there's a net increase in the number of firms in the year when there's this shock to one firm in the local I.O. You know, you can think about the impact of a death on the number of firms today, the year in which there's a death, uh, this shock. And you can see whether you know, a death tomorrow is impacting the number of firms today. And you can think about whether a death yesterday impacted the number of firms today. So uh, essentially, by rolling these regressions and showing these estimates, so in the year in which a printer dies, the number of firms goes up. A year later, it's still high. It doesn't fall back down. And a year later, and so on. And in the years before the printer dies, it's not true that there's a significant increase in the number of firms. Okay. So you know the, the, these deaths sort of uh, empirically ratchet up the number of firms in a city, and it doesn't come back down. Very quickly, you know, this is the distribution of printer deaths across cities in the period just before uh, the Protestant Reformation. So you know, in some sense, where we're going is thinking about things that are perturbing the number of firms competing in a city just before these new ideas come on the scene. This is the change in the number of firms. So these are the cities where no one dies. This is the cities where one person dies. These are the cities where two die. Okay, so um, the places where more people are dying, even in this shorter period, we're seeing the number of firms differentially uh, increase or, or not decline as, as much because this is actually a period where many cities are seeing the number of firms shrink. Um, so uh, over this time frame, a printer death is associated with like an extra firm. Okay? Um, so this is just looking at the pre-period. Um, I don't know if I, I'm sort of behind, so I might uh, push through this. Um, and then if you try, if you, you know, the next step here is to think about, okay, Arguably, these deaths uh, generate some exogenous variation in the number of firms. If you take these deaths as uh, delivering that exogenous variation, uh, what does that mean for uh, the likelihood that there's any Protestant books in these cities? And maybe just focusing on these columns, which are these are just the cities where uh, there is printing. So you know, it seems more sensible to focus on the cities with printing. Um, so we're seeing, you know, a, a firm. Uh, Leaving is associated with like you know a 70 percent uh, increase. A, a firm uh, t uptick in the number of firms is, is associated with a 0.7 increase in the probability. Uh, you know this is against the baseline case where it was like 0 0.15, 0 0.2. So it's 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 much larger um, uh, estimated this way. Um, another exercise is to look at uh, the number of Protestant books uh, here. Uh, the setup is to just basically do uh, something similar using both lagged firms and deaths, and then those together, and then just deaths to think about instruments for uh, the number of firms in the period just before Luther's uh, intervention, uh, and focusing just on the deaths and the print cities where Protestant stuff is printed. You know, this is uh, you know an extra firm is like an uh, eight percent increase in the number of Protestant uh, materials. Uh, you know, again, 
the earlier uh, estimates were slightly smaller. It was like a 5% uh, 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 increase in the, the number of Protestant books associated with an extra firm. Okay, so there's a lot of questions here. This is quite uh, preliminary, but one is, you know, okay, what about Catholic media? Maybe places where there are more firms produce more Catholic media. Uh, another is what about geographic diffusion? Uh, another is like what happens over time? And so uh, a first cut at this is just to think about, you know, how, how does competition relate to religious media in general? And then uh, some sort of differential slope for Protestant media. Uh, and then the same for uh, distance to Wittenberg and the same for the interaction between uh, competition and distance. Um, so, uh, you know, the implementation is a bunch of regressions with interaction terms. So let me just show you the pictures. So uh, when we look at the relationship between the number of firms in all religious media, uh, you know, there's something sort of flattish year by year. Uh, but uh, the Protestant media spikes up. There's a lot of noise here. Uh, you know, those of you who are interested in history, I mean, you might really be interested in this period. There's what's called the Peasants' War in Germany uh, in the 1520s. It's a huge uh, period of civil unrest. Um, Protestant media eventually sort of uh, settles down, so to speak, at a, a, a sort of more positive level after this period of unrest. Um, in terms of the literature on geography and Protestantism, like, the principal recent paper is this paper by Becker and Vossmann, and um, it came out in the QJ a few years ago. Basically, they, they think about Protestantism as delivering a demand shift for literacy. And their idea is, well, well what delivers variations in Protestantism? It's how far you are from Wittenberg, okay? Uh, and, you know, what we see is actually, it's really not just distance from Wittenberg, because places that are farther have more Protestant media. It's distance interacted with some measure of the local I.O. Okay, so this is sort of getting at, uh, you know, slicing the data on another dimension to think about this story of diffusion. So it's, it's not just are you close or far from Wittenberg, it's are you close or far from Wittenberg and how many firms were competing in the media markets when this new idea came online, okay? Um, okay. Uh, so a uh, final sort of suggestive gestural thing. So I, I guess I'm taking you guys at uh, sort of the word is like early stage. This is like uh, in, in the works. Like, you know, this is sort of the first bit is, okay, what are the determinants of the diffusion of Protestantism? But we are typically interested in thinking about media as like a treatment that's driving uh, outcomes. Um, so this is just a graph showing you uh, our media index for cities that do and do not uh, get official uh, Protestant Reformation laws. Um, and this is a graph showing you the timing of those laws. So these red bars are the dates at which cities get their first uh, Reformation law. This is sort of the formal inauguration of the Reformation. And so most of the institutional innovation is up front in like the 1520s. The, these laws are passed by city councils uh, or magistrates at the city level. And they govern uh, certain aspects of church services. They set up poor law. So social welfare will not be given to people who are idle and uh, dissolute, but will be given to virtuous uh, Protestant subjects. They set up a common chest, which is literally a chest into which social resources go, and that they will then be spent, OK? So, and including, like, there's, like, we're coding this stuff up. Like, the common chest, some, some, some of the provisions say, like, there's an auditing mechanism. Like, Matt counts it every other week, and I count it every other week, you know. Uh, the, there's a whole sort of set of social provisions for thinking about public goods. Um, and crucially, there's these public school provisions, and they provide, like, salaries for students. There has to be an annual audit of the school. We have to see whether the students and teachers are both showing up when they should be. Okay, So we're coding these up right now um, from these sources. Um, and this is the landscape of these laws. So uh, some cities get these laws and some don't. Um, and uh, very quickly, just to sort of uh, suggest these are sort of like landmarks for what we're going to do, uh, it's, it's true that uh, in cities that are subject to lords, having more firms is, makes you much more likely to get one of these laws. In general, 
firms uh, in the pre-period are not associated, or the number of firms competing are not associated with any difference in the likelihood of getting a, a, a reform. Um, so we've been sort of, this is maybe hopefully something that the collective, uh, the collective can uh, provide some thoughts on, if not right now over dinner or something. Um, the, the, we're thinking about a, a world in which, you know, you're, you're getting a law or not. So you have a limited dependent variable. Uh, but when there's like all sorts of problems with uh, the spatial uh, error, uh, you know, it's not just that our estimates are going to be inefficient. It's like they may be really wrong. Um, so thinking about how to, how to uh, model and describe this period, the, the, this process where you get like these little uh, revolutions in different places formalized in law is, is one of the things that we're working on right now. The big takeaways for now is we've got a measure of content in the media, which is novel, and it speaks to really one of the big changes in ideas in the grand sweep of history, right? Um, so, uh, you know, Luther going, so to speak, viral is, is one of the, the big stories of the Renaissance. Uh, where we're going is thinking about these manager deaths in the time series, and if there's uh, some purchase, cross-border media spillovers. Um, and ultimately, you know, there's some really interesting data for those of you who are interested in human capital accumulation that we're putting together. It's essentially micro data on every university student in every university in Germany. Um, and so we're going to see like who went to which school, where they came from, uh, and how like places where there were these primary education laws differentially sent students into higher education. Um, and comments and criticisms uh, would be uh, welcome.